Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh, that's quite loud. Um, nice to see you here in, uh, uh, at the Yurtia. I hope you all had an interesting show so far, the last couple of days. Uh, getting around in Hanover can be quite an exercise I uh, experienced myself. But uh, happy that you found uh, the way to the Poultry World Seminar on Antibiotic Reduction. Uh, welcome here and also a warm welcome to our online viewers, as this is a hybrid seminar. I am Fabian Brockiter and as the Editor-in-Chief of Poultry World, I will guide you through today's program. Uh, this seminar will focus on producing chicken with less or no antibiotics, whilst at the same time uh, keeping the birds produ producing in an optimal health. Uh, I have three speakers for you today who will cover the veterinary, the feed and the management experts aspects of ensuring uh, our birds' well-being. The reduction of antibiotics is first and foremost a human health issue. Uh, preventing bacteria from becoming resistant is essential to ensure uh, that these key medicines stay available to save lives. Um, our area of influence is of course poultry production and there we have our role to play. Um, as the livestock sector is seen as a reservoir of resistant bacteria uh, caused by antibiotic usage, there's both a legislative and a societal pressure on the sector to Im improve its act. And with that, um, I want to introduce our opening speaker of today. And that is Tiago Prucha. Uh, Tiago is poultry consult consultant at Fatworks and today he will guide us uh, onto a path of responsible antibiotic footprint in poultry production. A three-step process, uh, according to him, which includes reduce, replace, and above all, rethink. So, Tiago, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. Nice room. Indeed, it's loud. Um, so I'm here today to uh, talk about the path to responsible antibiotic footprint, very complex subject and it's very uh, much discussed already. The incentives are clear, Fabian already described them uh, very well. Um, the main one and the one that uh, makes us move not only on this um, subject but in all the other subjects in poultry production is the final consumer is the market that makes us um, do things. Um, so at the end, we do have to make sure that we comply with the needs of the market. Um, there are some important things to consider when we are thinking about um, reduction of the use of antimicrobials. Um, one of them is um, that people have to make money. Yeah? We all make a living out of uh, poultry production. So we have to maintain uh, good return on investment for the farmer, which is, let's say, the first intervenient uh, when we are talking about uh, meat uh, production uh, essentially as well. Um, so we have to make sure that um, they understand the problem, but also that they uh, understand how to go uh, around it and what are the alternatives, because it's a tool that they used for many, many years, and we cannot expect that they just changed. So here, the veterinarian plays a huge role because it's the contact with the farmer. Um, in this presentation, I wanted to talk about, in 15 minutes, about the top three interventions that we uh, see as the most relevant ones in the health side in poultry production. And the best way to look at that is really to look at why we use them. So I divide it mainly in two categories here. One in where we don't have uh, endemic or where we have endemic regions for uh, Newcastle disease, AI, uh, mycoplasma, uh, where the use of antimicrobials will be mainly for respiratory diseases and in another situation which will be more the European uh, setup uh, where we uh, have a non-endemic uh, uh, region and uh, gut health is the main um, precursor for um, for the use of antimicrobials. There are several, several uh, reasons why we see um, the misuse of antimicrobials. Um, one very often, and not only used in uh, poultry production, but a bit all, uh, in all aspects of medicine, uh, which is if it doesn't work, it doesn't harm, um, which comes together with 
uh, use of a broad spectrum of antibiotic whenever we have uh, a disease. Important to mention here that one of the main aspects here for the reduction of the antibiotics and one of the pillars is really to diagnose well. So that, that will be the first step uh, when we are talking about alternatives and how to uh, go around it. So the, responsi the responsibility of the veterinarian here is really to do a proper diagnostic uh, monitoring as well. But we can also not forget that we have an ethical responsibility with the animals as veterinarians that we cannot really just stop using um, antimicrobials whenever we have a problem. So if it's really uh, a pressing problem that we have in a farm, we still have to use them uh, because they are still one of the best uh, tools that we have nowadays. So cutting it short and going to the point, I divided, as I said, gut health approach, respiratory health approach, and the combined one, uh, which you'll see um, linked with locomotory, gut health, but also respiratory approach, um, that uh, I will mention in a bit. So the first one um, for gut health, one of the main uh, uh, problems that we have, also the oldest one that we have, is coccidiosis. Uh, it's a very important uh, contributing factor and a triggering factor for bacterial enteritis. So if we try to uh, think on what is the easier way to reduce the use of antimicrobials in a gut health perspective would be to uh, use alternatives or to better control, let's say, um, coccidiosis. So, no, the tools that we have for coccidiosis in general are well known. Um, we have, uh, for instance, ionophores, which have some, some antimicrobial ability. And it's important to mention that in some countries they do have some pressure to be reduced as well. And the best way that we have nowadays to make sure that coccidiosis control is um, well done and that we uh, decrease to a minimum um, the level of resistance that we have on the tools that we have available. Um, it's coccidiosis vaccination, uh, live vaccination, where we basically replace the field strains that we have with more sensitive strains. Um, it's um, very often linked with a drop of uh, performance when we talk about uh, vaccination conceptually, a bit uh, all around, but it's very well known as a good tool. Um, and it does have an impact not only on FCR, or not only on decrease on resistance for uh, the anticoxidals that we have, but also for FCR and for uh, the antimicrobial usage. So I wanted to show you a study that we did in Belgium. So this is a, um, a study with uh, the practice that we are linked to in Belgium, where we measured um, nine farms, so 113 flocks, and we divided them across three groups, one of which, so different cycles, uh, the first one where we have a pre-COX um, vaccination control, where we measured not only the FCR, but also the cost, so the use of antimicrobials here, it's translated into the cost of um, antibiotics in each cycle, let's say. And we see here three different groups, so pre-COX uh, uh, vaccination, uh, during and post. Um, pre and during, we don't really see a difference in performance, but we do uh, see a difference in the use of antimicrobials already. Um, and after, uh, in the cycles after, we can uh, reduce um, the number of days that we use antimicrobial usage to about 50% and lower the FCR uh, to about 0.03 uh, uh, points. Uh, of course, there's a lot of things that we could talk about uh, on vaccination uh, or coccidiosis vaccination and things that we have to be careful, but in general, it's a good tool um, to target this gut health problem that I was just mentioning. So this is for the gut health approach, for the respiratory health approach. Um, the first thing that we have to take into account is that is a very complex uh, problem in general. It's usually a combination of several diseases where you have a triggering or let's say a door that is opening for any disease that you see in this, in this, um, in this slide. And uh, after that, you start to see secondary problems that come along. So important to understand here that very complex disease 
uh, it's a combination of different uh, problems and the, the point here is really to diagnose it well and to make sure that we are finding the one that started the problem from the beginning. So usually we have, as I said, multiple viruses and bacteria circulating and when we have a problem being cholibacillosis or ORT, it doesn't mean that we have that problem, um, it just means that our birds are not able to fight something that uh, it's circulating uh, around. Um, in terms of lab diagnostics here, it's a very important tool um, to uh, control respiratory problems, but not only to confirm what we suspect, so not to go look to something that we already know that is there, but to uh, make a broader perspective of what we are trying to find um, and create a list, uh, a differential diagnosis, and uh, um, to create the monitoring from uh, that point. Um, important to understand that every pathogen has specific uh, needs, so there's no uniform approach when we are talking about respiratory diseases. Um, correct diagnoses are very important, and biosecurity is always a huge point when we are talking, especially when we are talking about uh, antimicrobial uh, um, reduction, so uh, antibiotic reduction. There are some examples that we can give here in terms of approaches that we can have in respiratory diseases. But again, uh, uh, I just mentioned some uh, here that can be important. Maternal immunity, uh, I give here the example of RT, but in general, something that we uh, do have to take into account um, to make sure that our uh, uh, progeny is protected. Um, in the case of, for instance, uh, not having any homologous uh, uh, vaccine on the market or commercial vaccines, I give here the example before IB, um, consider autogenous if it could be uh, um, an example or not, and they are um, at this moment um, comparable to the commercial ones, um, and considering eradication programs uh, with live uh, vaccines in breeders is always also a very um, important thing. In general, and this I think is a bit worldwide, we do consultancy a bit all over the world, and mm, Mostly the use of antimicrobials for uh, um, respiratory diseases is uh, usually for mycoplasma and for E. coli. Uh, for mycoplasma, um, we have a systematic uh, use of prophylactic uh, um, antimicrobials um, that, uh, of course, increase the use of antimicrobials that we have. And if we use that as a tool to control mycoplasma, there will be a point where we still have vertical transmission to the progeny, um, where we will uh, have uh, problems as well um, for the use of antimicrobials in terms of aerosaculitis or arthritis, problems that we may see. E. coli, very well-known uh, pathogen. Um, it's uh, very important, uh, or it's a very important pathogen when we are talking about first week mortality, uh, peritonitis in layers, and uh, many secondary infections. Um, when we talk about reducing um, antimicrobials, we do have to think about the pathogens itself and what are the alternatives that we have. So that's where replace uh, uh, come when we talk about uh, vaccination, for instance. What can we use here um, in terms of alternatives? And rethinking in terms of management, uh, what can we do that is alternative to the use of antimicrobials? Um, in terms of respiratory pathogens, sorry, uh, vaccines are a very important tool. Commercial vaccines take a long time to register. So they talk about the, we're talking about five years from uh, one point to uh, um, from the starting point, let's say, until uh, we have it in the market. And also we have some genetic drifts. So sometimes uh, we have some um, strains that um, appear uh, that the vaccine does not uh, cover. Um, and we have uh, some, in some cases, um, serotypes that don't have um, appropriate cross-protection. Um, so here, autogenous vaccines are a very important uh, tool to control the infection for these different strains. I tried to uh, arrange a case that didn't took a long time where we saw 
um, the advantages of auto vaccines here. Um, Colibacillosis, uh, it's caused by E. coli, which is an opportunistic uh, bacteria in the gut, which means that it will appear whenever we have a lack of immunity or, uh, for instance, if we have any um, uh, problem in the level of the gut that allows the bacteria to slip to, um, to, the, to, to, to the, the system of the bird. Um, th th we have different ways to um, look at pathogenicity when we are talking about uh, auto vaccines. Um, it's linked with the O serotype. We know that we have the O72, the O1. Uh, we also have the link with uh, virulence factors, but we also should look at the anamnesis at the level of the farm whenever we have a case described. So here, important to um, take a talk about severity of the lesions that we see, the mortality, um, and after that, isolated from uh, the organs, uh, also gives us the invasiveness character that a specific strain has when we are talking about acto of vaccines. And just to give a bit of a better view uh, what, for what I'm going to show. So here I show as well a study done in uh, Belgium. This is done by Pool Farm, which is a lab that we are uh, linked to, where we saw um, that in 2012, O78 had uh, a prevalence of approximate 50%. And uh, after that, we measured in 2016 uh, and 17, uh, and 2018 and 2019, the prevalence of different serotypes after starting the use of auto vaccines in this region. And we saw that uh, from uh, 2016 to uh, 18, a huge decrease in the use of, um, well, in the prevalence of uh, the serotypes O1, O2, and O78, which were the ones that are more uh, pathogenic, let's say, which doesn't mean that um, it's only because of the use of the auto vaccine, but we do have other data that show um, that uh, we have a huge decrease in, um, in antimicrobial resistance as well. So my time is finished, but I will uh, continue very fast. Uh, the last approach, so a combina combined locomotory or gut health respiratory approach, um, it's linked very much with the decrease on um, the integrity of um, our gut um, health, uh, which makes it uh, that the bacteria is able to slip through um, the uh, guts, but also because we have a decrease in the immune system. So we see problems like femoral head necrosis, kinky back, arthritis, uh, which are all reasons for the increase of antimicrobial usage um, and where we see uh, signs like um, decrease of mobility and uh, locomotory problems uh, there. Um, so how can we go around this? One of the ways that we know um, well that uh, work is to increase the immunity of uh, uh, the birds. 70% of the immune cells that we have uh, are present in our gut. So if we support early enteric development, we are for sure giving a good bo boost for good immunity in the bird and the ability to fight uh, these diseases. And the solution is, uh, or one of the solutions is early feeding. You have several systems that can be used for early feeding. Uh, both on farm, in the hatchery, during transport. I show here only one where we see uh, the effect that had not only in performance, but also in um, the use of uh, antimicrobials. Um, so here we see, for instance, the FCR decreased from 1.63 to 1.61. Um, the average treatment incidence decreased as well about 10%. Um, and uh, the average treatment incidence for enterococci in the farm also reduced for about half. And this just to show um, as this could work as a good solution for um, this approach. So uh, in conclusion, um, here early enteric development um, represents a very important uh, tool to um, reduce the use of uh, antimicrobials. Um, in the first days, uh, we can use as well uh, probiotics and uh, here important to consider 
um, the biosecurity in general, in the hatchery, in the breeder farms, and use early feeding as um, a support for um, the decrease of antimicrobial usage. So that's a bit what I wanted to show in this very limited uh, time for a very complex uh, topic. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you for the invite as well. Thank you, Thiago. Uh, don't sit down ah, yet. Stay, stay, uh, stay. Stay. There stay. There will be some questions from the audience, I think. Any questions? No? No. I have one. You, you mentioned um, uh, just in the last slide the, the on-farm hatching systems, mm -hmm. right? Um, but how do you vaccinate when the birds are hatched in the, in the poultry house? Mm -hmm. You can use vaccination in the hatchery, of course. That's mm -hmm. a solution. Um, but also there... Yeah, in ovo. In ovo, it's, of course, uh, not uh, sometimes in, in some situations or in some countries mm -hmm. not always possible. Oh. Um, but in the farm, it's also possible to, to do that with sprayers. You also have the gel. Uh, chicks usually have the preening uh, yeah. instinct uh, in the beginning. So um, the gel is always a good possibility whenever they arrive to the farm uh, or when they start uh, hatching. Uh, you can put them on the side and use the, the sprayer as a, as a solution for, right. for that. Thank you for explaining. Uh, another question uh, before I leave you uh, to go back to your yeah. seat. Um, the dynamics of reducing antibiotics worldwide are, are going at different paces. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in Europe we, we make good progress on, on mm -hmm. antibiotic reduction, but, but how is that outside Europe? Um, well, most of the pressure that we see uh, in other places of the world that don't have legislated the decrease of antimicrobials is because they have to export to Europe or to the US. Uh, but there are some uh, places where um, they uh, are making an effort to um, decrease the use of antimicrobials by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to consider that uh, many places don't have the experience of not using antimicrobial promoters mm -hmm. uh, like what we have. We learned a lot since 2005 when we had the ban of antimicrobial uh, uh, promoters. Um, so we do have to consider that these places go in a different pace, but also they have different needs for um, yeah, the, the velocity or the, the of the production itself. Okay, well, thank you for, for answering, uh, Tiago. No uh, your uh, uh, applause for, for Tiago. And now uh, I'll, I'll much. let you go. Thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, that brings us to the second speaker of today. Um, with pleasure, I wanted to, to introduce um, uh, Professor Jaroslav Dastic, and he is founder, CEO, Really? Oh, I'm so sorry. There was a mix-up in the, in the slides. Well, the second speaker of today is uh, Laurence Krapp. Laurence is Vice President of Research and Development at Sitlines, and he will explain uh, how to reduce antibiotics by implementing an effective biosecurity program, which is a real hot topic at this moment in time with avian influenza, but also with other diseases um, concerning gut health and antibiotic reduction. So, Lawrence, uh, the stage is yours, uh, as is my audience. Thank you, thank you. And hopefully nobody's disappointed I'm number two instead of number three, so. <laughs> sure, no, no worries, no worries, thank you. And, and today, you, you know, you've heard one talk about uh, how to use antimicrobials properly, right? What I'm gonna do is talk about measures you can take that allow you to reduce antimicrobial use on your farm with your flock without compromising the health, and just as importantly, without compromising your profitability, right? Because at the end of the day, it's a business, and, and you've got to protect both yourself and, and, the, and the animals. Uh, so that's going to be the focus of the talk. You'll see some of the different measures that you can take. An essential part of being successful in reducing antimicrobials is really all about biosecurity, the behavior, the methods and some of the different processes that are involved. A little bit about Sidlines. Um, Sidlines is a company, it was family owned for many years, been around 30, 30 years, and it was recently purchased by a larger company called Ecolab. Um, Ecolab is into many different industries. Uh, it's in the water, it's in the healthcare, it's in the food production. But as I'll show in a moment, you can understand why a company like Sidlines was very important to the strategic view 
that Ecolab had in, in, in what we call the food chain, right? If you think about any process, usually that first step, if you do it right, is key to allowing you to be successful in each subsequent step, right? And in the case of the food chain and Ecolab, we do a lot with processors, we do a lot with food processing, we do a lot in the retail industry, institutional industry, right? Not to promote Ecolab, but we sell the McDonald's and everybody else. But the one area that Ecolab didn't have any control over was the very beginning, what, what we call the livestock area, right? And the point is, without, without that opportunity, there could be a lot of problems that you create with step number one that create problems for step number two. For example, if you have chickens with a very high salmonella load, they go to the processor, then the processor is responsible for trying to reduce that. They've got to take different steps, measures that would be costly to them. So the idea for Ecolab was to use sit lines as a way to really impact that first step. And, and really that first step in a livestock area is fundamental to maintaining the safety of the whole food chain. So that's a little bit why it, it, it was a strategic decision, but one that we think could overall help the, the whole chain in livestock, whether it's poultry, swine, or any other potential animal. So I said earlier, biosecurity is a key to allowing you to reduce the use of antimicrobials, right? And I think you all understand biosecurity. It's about preventing the spread of diseases, preventing a, a pandemic, an epidemic. And in the case of endemic diseases, how do you control those? And if you have an outbreak, it probably means that biosecurity failed, right? So what can you do to ensure that you don't have that failure and you don't have any catastrophic impact on your flock? So when you look at a farm, there are many, many different elements that impact biosecurity, right? And some may be not top of mind as others. For example, the water quality. Are you treating your water? Is it of high quality? Does it have a low microbial load, right? Are you doing the right kind of cleaning and disinfection? Do you know the source of your feed, right? Do you have the right kind of hygiene from people going from the exterior to the interior? Are you doing hand hygiene? Are you doing foot baths, right? So the idea is biosecurity really encompasses many different facets and behaviors that are important to achieving maximum biosecurity that really then allow you to use less antimicrobials. And even things like pests, rats, darkling beetles, these all could play a role in a process. They're all vectors potentially for, for disease. So you have to be careful and understand how to be able to manage that correctly. A number of years ago, the University of Ghent did a study where they used a risk-based quantitative method to assess a number of biosecurity factors in a farm, really most of the ones I showed you on the previous slide. And what they did is they had the farmers assess uh, via questionnaire what kind of biosecurity measures they took across the entire farm, even things like where is the farm located? right? And they then help the farm understand how they can improve each of these facets. And they did a before and after study, right, on a number of metrics or characteristics. And what they found is that overall, if you do increase your biosecurity capability, you can actually get a very positive outcome in terms of things like total mortality, in terms of things like feed conversion rate, in terms of the production efficiency of your farm. So what happens is biosecurity, doing it the right way, allows you to reduce antimicrobial use, right? You can see it here. Antimicrobial use went down by 30%, but the farm's got a production increase, which meant profitability and healthier animals. So those are two bonuses that you get when you take the proper biosecurity measures. In looking at a farm and in looking at the external factors and the internal factors, some are more difficult to control than others. You may have no chance to move your farm, so you got to accept where it is. But when you think of some of the internal factors, things like a foot bath, hand hygiene, or cleaning and disinfection, those are things you have absolute control over if you choose to do them the right way. And when it comes to internal security within a facility, cleaning and disinfection is the most important thing that you can do. And the nice thing is there are products out there that will clean and disinfect the right way. And it's a procedure 
that really anybody can do. If, if you're not carrying out cleaning and disinfection correctly, you have nobody to fault but yourself, right? So what I'd like to do next is talk a little bit more about that because it is critical and it's not always clear that people understand how to clean and disinfect correctly. And what is cleaning and disinfection? Well, it, it, it's a way of creating a very high level of hygiene in the facility. If you clean and disinfect correctly, you can use less antibiotics. And as Tiago pointed out, right, there's a negative consumer, right, uh, uh, approach towards antibiotics, right? I mean, in the U.S., poultry producers all advertise now, no hormones, no antibiotics. So there's consumer pressure to reduce antibiotics. And the other challenge with antibiotics, obviously, is the formation of resistant bacteria, microorganisms. So if you can reduce antimicrobials, you're really doing the whole industry a favor, right? But getting back to cleaning and disinfection, right? It's part of good farm management. And what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means removing the soil. And, and you may think that should be a no-brainer, but as you'll see shortly, it's not always as simple as you think, right? And you want to get a smooth surface. Really, you cannot disinfect the surface if it has soil remaining. And sometimes soil is not always so visible, right? So you need to know that your cleaner is going to do the job. You want to get the right contact on the surface, and at the end, you can bring the disinfectant in. And the disinfectant is only going to be as effective as the surface that it's applied to, right? If it's not clean, you're not going to get the disinfection you want. You're not going to be able to reduce the pathogens, so you may still have a problem. So one of the things to consider as well when you're cleaning is, do you know the soil that you're cleaning? Because not all cleaners work the same way against all soils, right? If you have fats and oils, you need one kind of cleaner. If you have proteins, carbohydrates, you need another kind of cleaner. And in the case of a lot of the soil that you get on the farm, it's going to be a high organic load, right? There's going to be a lot of protein, some carbohydrates, but you got to make sure that you use a cleaner that's effective against these kinds of soils, right? And in the case of organic loads in the farm, that means you're going to probably want to use caustic. You're probably going to want to need the opportunity to hydrolyze. What you can see here are polypeptides to proteins. Ultimately, you break down the soil to smaller components so they're easier to dissolve and easier to remove from the surface. And that's going to depend, again, on the products that you're using. Now, a lot of people think you can clean with water. That's a mistake. Um, a lot of people think you can clean with commodity chemistry, caustic, or even bleach. That's a better step, but as you'll see shortly, it's not really going to get as clean as you need, right? So what we talk about in the industry, you need to use built products, built alkaline cleaners, built cleaners that contain surfactants, that contain chelators, because you need to accomplish a couple of things when you're cleaning, right? So what you may not realize, but you've all seen it, when you drop water on a smooth surface, you see beads of water, right? And what that means is if you apply water to a surface that you're trying to clean, the water's not going to penetrate the cracks or crevices. It's not going to get in there to loosen the soil. It's not going to allow you to clean. So you need a product that has surfactants that allow you, if you look at the right-hand side, the opportunity for that cleaning solution to get into the cracks, get into the crevices, start to lift the soil, right? You also want a product that's got chelators in it because you never know what the water hardness is on a farm. And if it's very hard water, that's going to impact the ability to form micelles and, again, get the right kind of cleaning action. And this is, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. I won't use a thousand words to describe this, but if, if you look at a study that was done with a high-protein soil, right, all the way on the left, you can see the impact of different kinds of, of cleaning approaches, right? Um, if you use just a caustic solution, if you use bleach, right, uh, acidic cleaners and down the line, caustic itself has some impact, but you still have a lot of soil on the surface. The bleach does a better job, but you still have soil remaining. Even the acidic cleaner, if you look closely, you see spots there. But when you look at a built alkaline cleaner, and, and, and there's a variety of built alkaline cleaners out there, you get a much better clean. And that's really what you need if you're going to ultimately disinfect the surface, right? And here's another way of looking at it. 
the better the cleaner, the more soil you remove, the easier it is for the disinfection to do its job. And then you're really getting at the opportunity to impact biosecurity. And it's using such what I call behaviors, protocols, the right approach to cleaning and disinfection to optimize your operation from a biosecurity perspective. So I'll put my sales hat on for a moment because Sidlines does sell built cleaners and disinfectants. And in fact, if you look at some of the pictures here with uh, competitive products versus one of our products called Kinosan, a white foam versus a brown foam. The brown foam means you're lifting soil off a surface. It tells you the product's working, working the way it needs to. So when you remove it and you disinfect, you're going to get the optimal effect. Some of the other characteristics that are important, you want your cleaning product to stay on the surface that you want to clean for as long as possible, right? And in the case of walls, vertical, you want foam that's going to cling, that's going to allow the product to work and achieve the desired outcome. And the final point, you want to use a good broad spectrum disinfectant, something like Virusid, which can kill many, many different types of organisms. And so at the end of the day, here's a solution to cleaning a disinfection that allows you to do biosecurity in its most optimal manner. So that's it for the talk. Uh, I'm happy to entertain questions and uh, happy for uh, your patience and your time. Thank you, Lawrence. It's quite, imp it's quite impressive to see uh, how a uh, sound biosecurity program works in day-to-day in, in -day life. There's, there's a lot of elements, yes. What, how does this resonate with, with, with farmers at the moment? Everybody knows the, the, the importance of biosecurity, but do they live up to the standards which they should? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. A, a lot of this is just behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you used to doing, and can you change your behavior and get a better outcome? And at the end of the day, it's elements like demonstrating if they choose to change their behavior mm -hmm. and they use less antibiotics, there's a benefit to them monetarily. Um, if the actual health increases or productivity increases, there's more profitability. So if they're willing to change their behavior, th they'll get a benefit, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like seeing is believing. <laughs> really good. Um, are there uh, questions from the audience? Just have a quick look around. No? Oh, I have a couple of them. Um, sure. <laughs> um, wha wha what would be the best method? That you, you said it's, it's more or less a two-step process. Uh, uh, cleaning, cleaning first and, and disinfection right. after that. Uh, but what is the best way to determine when a, a surface is really uh, clean before you disinfect? Sure. So a, a couple things to consider. Um, when you have a protocol and it works, then you can continue to use that protocol because you know you're using a product at the right concentration um, under the right conditions. Uh, people always say, well, if it's visually clean, it's clean. Mm. But in fact, there's still a lot on the surface that you can't see. And, and some of the methods that you can use are, for example, ATP swabs, mm -hmm. um, because they'll be indicative of an organic soil that's still there. Yeah. Um, and, and that's one way to do it. Sometimes you can actually use UV light, hmm. um, which is probably a little bit more expensive. But again, you know, you can fluorescence or, or, or other ways that you can look to see that there's still a residue on the surface that you didn't see visibly, but it's still there. Yeah. yeah and as you said, it's, it's really important to have like smooth surfaces as well. Eh? Uh, I know the an example, the better. Yeah. Uh, example from a broiler farmer with cracks in, in the concrete floor where uh, disease uh, couldn't be tackled. Right. No, that's a challenge. <laughs> All right. Um, one last. Yeah, Chico. Oh, I have a microphone. Well, OK. I yeah, think it's this one. Okay. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just a uh, curiosity, how do you handle situations like, uh, for instance, in the U.S., where the soil is reused um, in terms of cleaning and disinfection? How do you handle that? Um, is there like any type of protocol that you change? I know that you, you do, of course, the, um, the, the, the so it's processed, the, the soil itself, but uh, the cleaning and disinfection, how do you 
Yeah, it's it's a bigger challenge in the U.S. because usually it's a dirt floor. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. at minimum they'll they'll remove the litter. Yeah. But even they don't always remove the litter. But sometimes right? don't. That's yeah. That's and 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 so it gets back to the behavior. Yeah. And what you really have to do is show the farmer that if they do everything they can, they'll because it's a little bit extra work, but that they'll get a positive benefit. Be, because the, again, the biggest challenge there is it's not concrete floors, it's dirt floors. So you've got to take all the other, you've got to really clean the walls and the ceilings, get okay. the litter out. But it's a different, it's a little bit of a different procedure. Yeah. And, and in a way, you have to be a little bit more vigilant. Yeah. Yeah. Best way to do it. I think it's even more difficult in that circumstance. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time sure. and presentation, uh, Lawrence. Thank you very uh, much. My pleasure. A round of applause for Lawrence Grapp. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you might have heard part of the introduction of the next speaker already, uh, but it's again my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jaroslav, uh, Jaroslav Dastic. He is founder, CEO, and president of the board of Proteon Pharmaceuticals. So welcome. Um, he will get us up to speed on bacteriophages, his specialty. Uh, I'm looking forward um, to hear uh, how we can re reduce uh, the unnecessary use of antibiotics by using bacteriophages, Professor. Please go ahead. Tra Thank you, Fabian, for this introduction. Uh, good afternoon. So, uh, the topic has been already announced. So, let's uh, introduce Proton Pharmaceuticals to those who uh, don't. Uh, never heard about the company. This is a biotechnological company uh, that operates uh, uh, predominantly or has a headquarter in Poland uh, and uh, that is focusing on development of bacteriophage based products for animal health. So uh, we perceive ourselves as a part of like a microbiome story in biotechnology and in, in, in uh, biomedicine and in uh, animal health. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a quite important consideration uh, because okay, okay, you want to kill bacteria, fine, but not all of them necessarily, most of them are beneficial. So you are uh, at this moment have to rethink of certain uh, approach toward the development of effective method of controlling pathogenic bacteria and microbiome uh, consists not just only of bacteria but also of bacteria, uh, yeast, fungi and certain viruses and the predominant part of the viruses that are present in natural microbiome in healthy uh, animal are bacteriophages. So what we are working with are elements of uh, microbiome. Uh, and the company has 15 years history, 12 years of intensive research on uh, development of bacteriophage products. And uh, uh, introducing the company, I would uh, like to introduce bacteriophages also. So uh, bacteriophages, were practically used, were discovered more than 100 years ago, practically used and introduced as an antibacterial therapy pretty much just before the antibiotics. Uh, so there is a long uh, history of, of use in, in some part of the world in different therapeutic and prophylactic uh, uh, setups. But now they are sort of, they need to be reintroduced uh, based on the state-of-the-art scientific background, expected uh, industrial qualities and regulatory framework that we have in the area of, of whatever is touching uh, bacteria, microbiome, and live animal. And uh, the bacteriophages uh, are uh, the most numerous you can say microorganism on the planet, 10 to 31 particles is of course rough estimate, but the logic is you have a large number of bacteria. Each bacteria has some number of specific uh, bacteriophages that are just infecting and amplifying in this particular species of bacteria. 
So then they have to outnumber bacteria on the planet, and you know that this is a huge number of, of them. So uh, what, of course, is important uh, is uh, that they are built from protein and DNA or RNA. So what it means, there is no residue uh, treatment, whatever, when it comes to bacteriophages. You don't have to worry what is happening really with bacteriophages uh, if those are natural components of, of, of biosphere. You play with density here, and then they will be slowly stop being propagated when there is no the host, the bacterial host around. And uh, uh, they are actually the, the, the natural controller of bacterial population. So uh, every day, most likely 20 or 30% or of, 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 of bacteria of given species uh, are dying because of, of bacteriophages. So this is natural balance that you observe everywhere. You observe them in the, in the microbiome as well, uh, where bacteriophages and, and bacteriophages are in, in constant struggle. And uh, as I already mentioned, they are very specific. This is challenging when it comes to the development of the practical solution or product. But there is also beneficial because you know that they do not harm the microbiome. You really can uh, apply them w with a very narrow, sp knowing that they are very narrow spectrum agents, call it this way. Uh, and uh, one uh, important element of, let's say, bacteriophage uh, biology without making it complex. Uh, generally, they have two types of, of, of life cycle or, or two, two uh, different approaches toward the bacteria that they are targeting. They are ad either lytic, meaning that they infect bacteria, amplify, kill the bacteria, and, and look for another uh, target, or they get incorporated into the uh, uh, bacteria, uh, they incorporate the genetic mat material into the genome of bacteria and stay there and then get reactivated. Those are called lysogenic. We are working and whatever we are touching is lytic bacteriophages. We are using lytic and we know how to distinguish these two categories. And uh, we develop some technological platform that is now allowing us to prepare, generate, and uh, manufacture, and, and, and put on the market a uh, bacteriophage-based based product. And we believe that bacteriophages are important element of mitigation of antimicrobial resistance. So I will not elaborate on that. That is simply, it's, it's really on the horizon. You see that there is increasing risk of ha having a major problem with uh, anti, uh, antibiotic resistance bacteria. And of course, when you look at the, uh, uh, what is the, the origin of the problem, you know that the more you use generally, it doesn't matter for human or animals, the more you use antibiotics, antibiotics stay in the environment. So you are create a situation when you are selecting constantly and giving privilege to antibiotic resistance bacteria. So you need to reduce generally the amount of an, uh, antibiotic everywhere. And they are quite, uh, I would say, persistent chemical molecules. They stay for, for long. And now, because you have significant usage of antibiotic in uh, farm for food and generally in agriculture in farm for food animals, so this is logical pressure to mitigate or start mitigation from, from this of usage in this area. And that's what poultry, for example, is facing as a challenge, how to keep productivity, control cost, but reduce antibiotics that were well known, sort of handy and always ready to be used and with a long history uh, of application. Uh, that just illustrates that the more you use, the, the, the more problem you create. It's just a correlation uh, showing that, that, uh, that when one of the scientific studies, when, then when you are 
using more doses of, of uh, uh, antibiotics in given geographical location, then you observe higher number of resistance bacteria of given species. That was a streptococcus. And of course, you have a political pressure that's always is clear. Lately, the European Parliament sort of introduced some ban on categories of antibiotics for veterinary use, it's creating a, a clear challenge. So why phages? Phages don't care if the bacteria is antibiotic resistance or not. They can be applied in the life cycle, in the production cycle, in parallel, together with antibiotics. There is no negative interaction, just the opposite. They are frequently synergistic. And they do not increase the antimicrobial resistance by when we apply them. At the same moment, they allow us to reduce usage of antibiotics. Is the, is the beginning of the story. It's just happening that they are first products available that, based on bacteriophages, are controlling certain type of bacterial pathogen. And they are already commercially available in, in different locations. They are not massively used yet, but there are certain reasons to, 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 to introduce this technology to, uh, to practice. This is an example of uh, one of our product, Proteon product, that's the Bafacol against avian pathogenic E. coli. Not just E. coli in general, those phages are very sort of narrow-minded, they, they, they can tell the difference. So they, they, are, they have preference against, uh, of a action against avian pathogenic E. coli. Make it very simple. We made a, a control experiment when we compare the two situations, sort of scenario, you are using from the first day bacteriophages, or, uh, and you are challenging early at the first week with, with, with uh, two strains of uh, avian pathogenic E. coli. Then you look what is happening, and then uh, you don't do anything, or you make intervention quickly with enrofloxacin, we can discuss why this antibiotic but this frequently used, or you're using sort of prophylactically bacteriophages. And you see the outcome, and you see sort of this low mortality, nothing happened, close to 20%, that's E. coli challenge. Our product, keep it at 5%, and enrofloxacin significantly reduced. If you look at the performance, you see clearly the, the reason to use bacteriophages. So this is one of our two products called Bafacol. Our other product, and the first one is Bafazal, is targeting Salmonella with preference for Enteritidis tifimurium, where it's very effective. Bafacol I already introduced. So bafazol is a cocktail of four lytic or violent phages. I will not elaborate on the, the details of the product, just make it quick. Uh, the practical usage on the large scale, we have many examples. You simply control the salmonella and you observe the results at the slaughterhouse level. And the application is simple in drinking water, like the other product. The category we go is for in, in regulatory, in the places where, where we uh, already have uh, uh, access, is feed additive. Uh, and this could be perceived as a, as a valuable addition to the sort of food safety uh, of, of, of poultry, of, of broilers and egg-laying hens controlling salmonella uh, at the farm, starting from the, the early from the first day, as you can already apply on the first day in the farm for chicks. Uh, and yes, we observe also some 
small positive effect on performance because Salmonella is not so completely neutral for, for even for, for broilers, even Salmonella enteritis, for example. Uh, this, the second, I will just uh, 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 present one more slide on the results, is actually almost like repetition of the previous experiment, but the previous experiment was performed in Europe in a, in a very nice, clean, extremely good environment with the one person mortality. This is Asia. It's also a controlled study, but the background happened to be higher, more like 8%, not, not great. Okay, still the challenge with APEC, with uh, E. coli, made it much uh, worse. And uh, you have the comparison of two types of treatment with uh, bacteriophages. W either we stop at 14 days, cutting cost by half, or keep continue for the whole cycle. And pretty much the effects were the same. So you had clearly normal, you go to the four person. So, so you really go even below the background. So we expect that the background was not like a you know, sterile environment. There were some E. coli in the, in the background. That's the explanation. And uh, beside poultry, uh, Proteon is already developed aquaculture uh, product uh, that is, uh, th that is uh, already in the, uh, on the market. It's against Pseudomonas and Aeromonas. In the pipeline is uh, anti-vibrio or vibrio uh, for aquaculture. Uh, we are working on some other poultry products. They are in the pipeline. Uh, and we are also have very advanced, already sort of ready for or entering uh, not registered clinical trials uh, product for mastitis in, in, in direct uh, And we have, let's say, quite advanced uh, anti-swine edema uh, product in, in our pipeline. So uh, we are looking for different types of networking, partnering, uh, open for discussion of, of uh, interested in commercial trial or uh, distribution. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jaroslav. Please. Thank you. Uh, on time. Uh, you're really on time. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions from the audience on bacteriophages? Yeah. Laurent? So, first off, I think. I'll yeah. just talk loud. Thank you. I think phage is a really novel way to, to deal with uh, pathogens and also, uh, you know, antimicrobial resistant strains. Um, do, do you concern yourself at all with how public would react to the use of phage in, in a, a product that they eat later on? Uh, I don't think that they should react negatively. Uh, bacteriophages uh, have really nice story. Uh, they are the natural elements of biosphere that, sure. that protect us. So why? Uh, of course, you can scare everybody saying you have viruses in your gut. Fine. Okay. There, you know, but that's then the everything can be, can be made to be sort of a scary. But generally speaking, no, I don't think that the, the I think that the, the public is more and more aware of sort of good bacteria, bad bacteria, sort of uh, bio ready mm -hmm. for, for things. Those are natural components. This yeah. is sort of like synthetic biology. We, we, we don't manipulate with viral genomes in, in those guys. We are just screening, finding the proper candidates, put them together in a very rational way. We have a perfect data on safety. Uh, we have a publication of the effect of our product on human microbiome ex vivo. I can share with you. So uh, they, 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 we've got the, why we still struggle with uh, registration in, in Europe as yeah. the first ever, first uh, so advanced um, uh, registration dossier, we already obtained uh, uh, the highly positive, spectacular opinion on safety safe for human, for animals, for environment. We've done everything on the safety side. 
And that's the reason that the agency, which is called European Food Safety Authority, still didn't give us a green light deliberating about, well, how many efficacy studies and so on, but they already released a very positive statement yeah. on the safety. So you have many evidences that should, should be presented uh, to, to, uh, to public. So yes, that's always a risk of a new technology, but I don't think it's a no, it's, problem. It's, it's, it's old from the origin, but the technology is, is reintroduced and that makes it a little bit more unknown, I think. I think that's the main, mm, the main problem, especially true, with Russia. True, true, true. Mm. But that's, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that can be presented different ways because mm. phages were discovered in Pasteur Institute, Excellent. as you Excellent. may know, in parallel in London. And probably nobody knows, but one of the first clinical trial of penicillin in UK was parallel by the study, clinical study, of combination of this new penicillin with the bacteriophages. Oh, but that so <laughs> brings me to an interesting <laughs> point because I wrote that down as a, as a question as well. Um, the, the combined use of, of bacteriophages and antibiotics, is that a problem or is it a feasibility? Is, is, it, is that possible? No, it's, a, no, it's, 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 it's interesting uh, option. Uh, because, but you know, I presented here with certain angle, mm -hmm. prophylactic, uh, without re yeah, of some replacement, or some reduction, more room for maneuver to use or not use classical antimicrobial. That's that's one part of the story. But there is there is synergistic effect, mm -hmm. and also there is a chance, not proven, that actually you may uh, sort of rescue antibiotics, there are some clinical data in humans, that y y y you are introducing bacteriophages in after a very prolonged treatment mm -hmm. with antibiotics, and you observe that the uh, level of antibi uh, antibiotic resistance in the isolates from patients is getting back, uh, meaning that the, the, the sort of less antibiotic resistance yeah. bacteria are getting into this balance with highly and so you, it's, it's, it's still not proven, it's not mm. scientifically sound, but there, there are reasons to investigate the interaction between antibiotics and bacteriophages and, and look at this very carefully. It might be very important to learn more. It could even be that there would be a direct, uh, less resistant effect of bacteriophages. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's one of the angles mm. of, of some of the research. Interesting. Question? Uh, please, uh, is there a microphone? No. It's for the rest and also for the audience at home. Um, once you mentioned uh, things about the resistance, uh, might come to mind that if you choose 100% lytic phages, does it contribute to the fact that does not allow in any case the production of uh, resistant bacteria afterwards? You are asking about the sort of building up resistance against phages. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, yes. We are the, to to prevent building up resistance. We are designing the the the, the cocktail. In we we have the, the the experimental data. We look at the frequency in vitro of creating resistance or selecting resistance, but not resistance against antibiotic phage resistance phenotype of bacteria. And you, uh, by, by having well-designed uh, cocktail and only lytic phages, because these, these are highly predict predictable effect, uh, you are talking about lowering the chances by 10 to 4, which is, which is quite important. So in the open system like a farm, the broiler farm, one cycle, yes, you really have a very low chance to observe resistance, especially if you don't go for a monophage, a single phage, or you, you don't just pick up randomly the phage, but, but try to, to really to, to look at the development phage of the product already, what is happening in terms of the, 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 the sort of you know, the resistance or phenotype of bacteria selection of that. So this is, this is one. And this is the reason we are really using a uh, lytic 
lytic, lytic phages exactly. Uh, and that is the reason we are working on cocktails and uh, we look because the cocktail provides some, you have some type synergistic, some uh, negative effect of combination of phages. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's is exactly the essence to, 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 to not have something that will be quickly uh, thrown a, a, away because the bacteria will learn how to, to co coexist with this particular phage. So that it's, it's a long story, but, <laughs> but yes, you're, t you're Interesting the question, point. interesting answer. I have one more question in the back. Thank you, that was really interesting data. I've just got a question. One of the previous speakers spoke about how avian pathogenic E. coli changes, mm -hmm. serotypes change. Are you able to change out the formulation if there is a shift in E. coli? And then I've also got a question. Sure. You talked something about regulation. <coughs> what about you know, uh, regulation in the United States? Yeah, the, 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 it, 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 the regulation depends on the category, geography, and so on. So it's, 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 it's a little bit hard uh, to say. Uh, but uh, mm, yes, uh, answering the question, we, we, we are, when we are looking at the product like this avian pathogenic, we were looking carefully at the, the large number of, of isolates fully uh, sequenced um, uh, uh, and, and having the genetic data. So we know what is the host range. And of course, host range will always address the, the current situation. So you will s see something. Uh, probably adding, finding a phage and adding to the existing cocktail, I, I don't discuss the regulatory, that will depend on every location. Uh, I'm saying probably it's, it's, it's quite uh, quick uh, uh, to, 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 to remedy the, the situation. If we are still thinking about, you know, like a serotype of E. coli, uh, and if the starting point is good, meaning the host range is very, very large. And of course, you never go 100% host range. So we, we don't have this practical experience yet. We are at the, so we cannot You're really still cover the be all completely variation. confident. Yes, but, but, uh, but uh, that's probably the way to, to, to move. Everybody, when thinking about using bacteriophages, is thinking about having a large collection of components that can be quickly uh, added, but it's not like those are the products that will have to be adjusted every, you know, six months or every season. I don't think so. The, the time will be different, but definitely some adjustment and uh, uh, sort of reaction to the ongoing epidemic or zoonotic situation will, will, will be needed. We know, we know that, yeah? Clear answer, uh, in my opinion. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dastic. Thank you very much. Your applause thank for, you. for the presentation. Thank you. So that brings us almost to the end of this seminar already. Uh, I want to express my gratitude to the speakers of today, Thiago, uh, Jaroslav, Lawrence. Thank you very much for, uh, for being here. Uh, a great thank you for you as the audience as well. Some great questions I, uh, I heard. Uh, happy to discuss them here. Uh, it was my pleasure uh, to have you here, both physically and also online, uh, as a guest of, uh, of Poultry World. And I invite you all to keep an eye out on our website, poultryworld.net, uh, for further information and our socials, of, of course, as well, where we will share a link uh, to this seminar as well, so you can follow uh, or rewatch uh, the information which was shared here. So thank you again from myself and uh, the MISET team. Uh, when you are going out, there will be a goodie bag for you to, uh, to pick up. Thank you very much. <laughs>